Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back uh, to the Prioritizing Equity series uh, hosted by the Center for Health Equity at the American Medical Association. My name is Dr. Aletha Maybank, uh, and I'm Chief Health Equity Officer at the American Medical Association. Uh, we've had some amazing conversations, uh, and I'm really looking forward to today's conversation with uh, the guests that we have. Just a, a few reminders. Um, the Center for Health Equity, our goal is really to work to embed and facilitate a process to embed health equity across the entire enterprise into our performance and practice and, and all it is that we do, as well as evolving and transforming the culture that we have at the American Medical Association. Um, there has been lots of work and activity around COVID, so if you haven't checked out um, our website, um, there's a Health Equity Resource Center uh, for COVID-19 that is there. Um, and for our previous conversations that we've had, you can go on the AMA YouTube site and find uh, the categories, lots of information and lots of videos, but you can also find the, the previous uh, episodes that we've done. So I encourage you all um, to do that. Uh, and so, you know, as we move forward in today's conversation, you know, early in May and, and, and actually, you know, as the pandemic began, um, and it being labeled and the narrative around it being a virus and a, and a China virus more specifically um, that has been used by our top level administration has absolutely been harmful, um, harmful to mindsets, harmful to just, you know, how we are advancing in this country as it relates to equity, harmful for our patients and harmful for us as physicians. Uh, and, you know, AMA definitely released a statement at, at some point in, in May about, you know, racism and xenophobia. Um, and, and how it must stop, and, and we don't condone it at all, clearly. Uh, and, but it still continues. Um, and even, you know, I was expressing before, before we got on this conversation, I had a post about, you know, a statement we issued about World Health Organization, our withdrawal from it, and, and the danger of that. Um, and some of the posts that really um, were elevating or the comments were, you know, well, it's owned, you know, and by China. And so this is why we shouldn't do it. And so this, this just sentiment just kind of is pervasive. Um, and uh, throughout many aspects of our, our country um, and our society, um, we are just to, to let folks know, working on a survey actually right now to survey physicians um, that are mar uh, minoritized and mi marginalized in this country, there's not much asking about our experience. And so uh, we've taken it upon ourselves to do so. So if anybody's interested actually in um, completing the survey, we're gonna put the link in the chat box so that you can also um, complete the survey. But this is a way for us um, to learn more about AAPI communities and the voices of, of all of us, truthfully. Um, and I just wanna acknowledge um, the, the um, diversity um, I may use the term Asian, um, but understanding that there is tremendous diversity um, within that term. And, I'm, and whomever's on this conversation can speak to however folks like to use in terms of narrative, um, but that we really fully recognize the diversity within the community. So now introducing um, our panelists, uh, we have Ignatius uh, Bao, who is uh, a JD uh, policy consultant for the National Council of Asian Pacific Islander Physicians. If you can just wave your hand just a little bit, that would be awesome. Thank you. Uh, we have Jay Bot, Dr. Jay Bot, uh, who is an internist and an NBC News contributor and former health equity leader and chief medical officer at the American uh, Hospital Association. Jay, hey, awesome. Uh, we have Dr. Ryan Huerto, who is a family medicine physician and health service researcher. Ryan, okay. Uh, we have Dr. Julie Morita, who is executive vice president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I think she wrote, I think she did it while I was reading. <laughs> so great. <laughs> we have Dr. Ray Sabo, who is assistant professor at the City of Hope Medical Center in Duarte, California. If you just wave your hand, Dr. Smo, that'd be great. Awesome. And um, we have Dr. Manisha Sharma, uh, who is in California with the California Healthcare Foundation, and she's a leadership fellow there. Uh, so thank you all, you know, for joining today, um, you know, in, in this wonderful series. And you all are tremendous leaders, uh, highly dynamic, and just so excited to speak with you. So I'm going to open it how we usually open it. And, you know, I, you, you know, an hour is never enough time, but that's all we have. But 
what I want to hear from you is kind of again, where are you like literally in this country? Um, and how have you been doing over the last like four or so months? Uh, and, and like, where are you now? Like, how, how are you feeling like right now? So um, let's start with uh, Julie. Great. Alisa, thanks so much for inviting me to participate in this and also for denouncing xenophobia and racism. I think AMA made a strong statement when you all did that and came out strongly. Um, I am, as you said, the Executive Vice President for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is housed in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, and I was commuting back and forth between Chicago and Princeton for the first um, months of the pandemic. But then in March, we shut down and I've been in Chicago since then. In terms of how I'm doing, I think both professionally and personally, I'm feeling highly motivated by both the pandemic, but also by the anti-Black racist events that have occurred recently. I think these two things in general have just led me to believe that the work that we're doing at our foundation is really the right work to be doing. We're focused on building a culture of health and advancing health equity, and it couldn't be more relevant than it is right now. And then from a personal perspective with the anti-Asian racism that was experienced early on with the pandemic, I think um, it just really struck a no note with me. I just struck a chord with me that I felt like where in the past I might have been more um, likely to turn the other cheek and to look mm -hmm. the other way and just to keep moving. I didn't feel like it was appropriate to do that anymore. And I was inspired a bit by my parents. I, I think I wrote, I wrote an op-ed earlier this year related to their experience in internment and how they often were stoic and didn't really speak out about it. But then when 9-11 occurred and with anti-immigrant problems that have happened recently, they started speaking out. And I think the COVID and the anti-Black racism really have motivated me to do more and to speak out more. So I'm feeling highly motivated both professionally and personally. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm doing that commute, I'm, I'm the reverse of you. So I was in Chicago and now I'm in Brooklyn, just housing out here in Brooklyn. So I understand that. Uh, Jay. You're on mute. You're on mute. Great, sorry, thank you. Great to be with all of you. And uh, Aletha, thanks to you uh, and the American Medical Association for uh, the opportunity to come together and talk about this work and really just echo uh, Julie's comments about uh, lifting up uh, these issues and, and really creating both conversation and opportunity for sharing that fuels the fire to do more um, to make a difference. And so really grateful for that. I'm in Chicago. And uh, I'm a community uh, health, public health physician. I'm taking care of patients uh, on the south side at a community health center, um, which I uh, really care deeply about. Uh, and it gives me a real lens and perspective into the challenges that uh, our communities are facing, and particularly those that are underserved and vulnerable. I'm also spending uh, some time helping the state with their long-term care nursing home response to COVID. And as a geriatrician, you know that piece is uh, close to me. I think those um, communities are so vulnerable uh, and again giving us more insight on how we might chart a different course for the future to help lift up uh, health of, of uh, those communities in equity. And um, I uh, am also um, trying to uh, through ABC News comment and lift up issues uh, and tell the stories of those folks that people experiencing the pandemic but also those that are finding ways to fight it uh, effectively um, and, and learning through it. And these issues that we talk about today have been uh, paramount uh, in, in the conversations that have been happening there. Um, professionally, uh, I feel really good about uh, the work I'm doing. It's, it's you know, uh, I think, soulful, and it's really given me a sense to um, connect uh, back with uh, the front lines of care, which I had been uh, away from for some time um, in a meaningful way. And so that's really given me you know, a different perspective and lens than I had it as at the American Hospital Association in a systemic way of what was going on. Um, and that's really been interesting from tents outside the community health center to home visits to testing um, in churches and in other community venues. Um, you really see how people um, are experiencing their lives uh, in this moment and in a very challenging uh, way, uh, including, you know, the, the folks that are essential workers that are um, there for so many uh, in many different ways, including our colleagues that are clinicians and working on care teams. Um, and personally, you know, I, I am fired up and uh, echo, you know, Julie's sort of motivation. Uh, and I think there's, you know, a window of opportunity here that uh, we have that hopefully 
just becomes larger and not smaller, um, as we've seen in other moments in history um, where they have become larger and they have uh, both civil rights, suffrage, voting, uh, and numerous other uh, along the way. But we've been here before in some ways around the issues of racism and police brutality in 2016 and the summer of 2016. And I didn't necessarily see the kind of sustainable action and, and um, I hope that is, but I'm also struggling, um, struggling with the, uh, the toughness and the challenges. And now we're back at the place we were several months ago um, and uh, struggling with the issues and conversations I'm having with my own communities of friends, families, parents. You know, my dad was a pharmacist on the South side of Chicago for most of his life. And it's now interesting to talk to him and others um, in sort of the anti-Black sentiment or also those that have been supporting these communities within our culture. Um, and, and we're going you know, to come back yeah. to that, Jay. We're, we're gonna so that's, that's part of what I'm struggling with uh, and yeah. working through. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Samoa? Uh, where am I at? Um, <laughs> I'm exhausted. Um, just so you know, I'm an endocrinologist uh, and um, my research is in the interplay between diabetes and cancer. And most of my work is in optimizing metabolism um, in cancer survivors. But I'm also the, the lead for the National Pacific Islander COVID-19 response team. Um, and uh, the some of the somewhat what's not really publicized often is that in many of the states that report disaggregated data, um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders have the highest rates of disease. And one may ask, why is an endocrinologist heading a you know, infectious disease task force? Um, well, uh, I think the major reason is because our every day is chronic disease. Uh, that's, that's what um, leads to death in, in the majority of our community. And a lot of the, the socioeconomic inequities that have led to poor access um, and social determinants of health that lead to chronic disease are leading to uh, the higher predisposition uh, to COVID-19 uh, in these communities. And that chronic disease infrastructure is the only thing in place right now for Pacific communities to address COVID. Um, you know, and we, we haven't had a national voice um, and we realize how that has been really detrimental when advocating for um, uh, a community that's, that's very disparate, you know. So um, I get what Julie's saying, you know, I, I'm seeing patients full time uh, and um, just um, finishing a manuscript and writing a protocol on top of Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting. And I appreciate this opportunity um, because I'm out of my depth, you know, I loved my silo, it was comfortable. I, I had a research team, uh, you know, uh, people had designated jobs and now I'm, I have audience with public and state health departments and the CDC and we're talking about um, budgets, um, contact tracing, community health workers and social determinants. And I'm, I am not that training for it, you know, and it's been a really, steep learning curve. Um, and I feel like physicians, especially, uh, we're called, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the where's Waldo, you know, for some reason, I keep showing up in places um, that I look around and I'm like, what am I doing here? Um, and I think that's the nature of our profession is that our, our capacity in certain fields leads us to leadership in, in many areas. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been tiring. So, so I appreciate being able to vent <laughs> with yeah. a group that understands fully. Thank you. And I'm glad you took this, this opportunity to do that because oftentimes, especially in these are professionalized, honestly, I think that that's kind of white, uh, whiteness and how we come to the space of 
of having to kind of be closed and not talk about, you know, what's really happening and what's going on in our experience through it. We've internalized that so much um, and it's harmful, like, and, and it's exhausting. Um, and I think it's really important that we're able to be candid and, and to speak our truth um, because it is fully who we are. It doesn't take away from what we can do. I think it actually completely adds. So I definitely acknowledge and appreciate um, the authenticity that you just brought to that that moment. So thank you to everybody that's brought so far, actually, but thank you. Um, Ignatius, what, how's it going for you and where you are and all of that? So I am here in San Francisco, California. I am the proud son of a refugee from China uh, in who in her own way ended up being I, what I would consider a civil rights pioneer because she was one of the first uh, Chinese bilingual teachers in the San Francisco Unified School District. Um, to really make sure that Chinese speaking students could get the, a quality education. Um, I spent 10 years as an immigration lawyer and worked uh, with a lot of different immigrants and refugees from all over the world, and then did a career turn and worked on HIV and AIDS in the Asian and Pacific Islander communities and really learned um, how uh, communities can be invisible in the midst of a, of a pandemic. Um, and really tried to lift up the voices of, of Asian American and Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian communities during that time. So it feels a little bit deja vu to now be in COVID-19 and again, be on the forefront of trying to lift up the needs um, and the issues for Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities with the National Council of Asian Pacific Islander Physicians and other Asian and Pacific Islander groups that I'm working with. Um, but it feels also like this really important moment of opportunity. One of the things that I've been saying is we're not going to go back to normal. We need to redefine what normal is. This is an opportunity for us to think about these issues in a bigger and bolder way. Um, to think about, we'll talk a lot about data collection. I think we've broken open this conversation where nobody can protest anymore to say data isn't important by race and ethnicity and so many other factors. Um, the question is, how do we use that data and how do we make sure that that data is in the hands of the community so that we can advocate for what we really need? I gotta unmute myself. Dr. Sharma, thank you very much, Ignatius. Um, Dr. Sharma Manisha, how are you? Where are you? Yeah, so first I just wanna say thank you, Letha, for having me on and having us on have this conversation. I just, I really want to put out there that I'm a social justice family medicine physician who um, didn't join the AMA because of the history of the AMA. And I literally joined the AMA because of you. Um, and it's the truth. And I actually got a lot of other physician of color physicians of color to actually join the AMA because you give us hope. And so I just wanted to put that out Thank there. Yes. I told that to your producer, but I'm, I'm saying it out loud because it's really <laughs> important because you elevate with intentionality the conversation about health equity. It's not even just a conversation. There's an actionable component to it. And that it makes me have hope that the AMA is shifting um, from its history to a place of um, true awareness and wokeness, if you will. So where am I? <laughs> um, so I am actually uh, currently in Kansas City. Um, I am, you know, originally in San Diego, um, um, but I'm in Kansas City with my uh, family, um, uh, trying to uh, pick up the pieces from the death of my sister uh, pre-COVID in February. We're trying to seek justice for her killing. Um, so that's where I'm at here on a personal level. Um, I'm also in Trump land, which is also a little uh, anxiety provoking <laughs> just because I think it's really amazing geographically to see the differences of where you are um, and just having signs of Trump and bumper stickers. It's actually a little PTSD-ish, I mean, if you will, um, just to see it. Um, um, so on a personal level, that's sort of, I'm in a space of exhaustion, as um, Ray said, I'm in a space of being tried. Um, I'm also in a space of self-preservation. Um, a lot of the work that I'm doing on a social justice level is really, um, we started votehealth2020.com um, to get people to vote. If you really are enraged 
um, by the anti-Black racism that's existing in this country. If you are enraged over how COVID has been handled in this country, the way to do this is through the actionable and your right to vote and in wanting to preserve um, folks' ability to vote, but also to fight for folks to actually be able to be champions of voting. Um, we're doing it through the lens of healthcare championship, if you will. Um, if you are a healthcare provider, we are trusted and tr you know trusted folks that we can actually be part of the of voting. So that's kind of what we're working on 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 the outside. Um, as a mom, I'm a mom to a black son. So I'm also trying to very proud mom, <laughs> of my son, but he's four and trying to help him navigate through um, what he sees on TV or what he hears as conversations um, and being intentional about um, helping him, helping him understand his amazingness as being a black young man, um, and also um, that we're here to protect him and also to help him be part of the change. He wears a vote mask. Um, he's like, um, he tells people, um, you know, that he's amazing. And I think that that's the steps that we can take. Um, and so that's kind of the space that I'm in. It's a, um, it's a smorgasbord, <laughs> if you will. Thank you. <laughs> I gotta just keep myself muted. Appreciate that. All right. So Ryan, um, I'm gonna. I want you to say where you are, um, and then I'm gonna continue a question after you finish, and it might continue with what you say. But go ahead. Let's hear. Absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be on such a awesome panel with folks that I admire so much. But um, in terms of where I am, I'm currently a national clinician scholar uh, at the University of Michigan. And originally I'm from California. I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, in terms of how I'm doing, I think Dr. Samoa said it the best. I'm tired, I'm frustrated, mm -hmm. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Um, I think relatively speaking though, I'm, I'm doing well, I'm healthy. My family's healthy, so things could definitely be worse. Um, and I do sense like a collective sense of loss in my community, uh, given everything that's happening with the pandemic, with systemic racism. Uh, on a, a lighter note, I do kind of want to highlight some things that are giving me life right now. And there's an organization known as Affirm, which is a transnational anti-imperialist feminist organization that they actually created a website called canlungan.net. That's K-A-N-L-U-N-G-A-N.net, where they're literally tracking Philippinex essential uh, or frontline healthcare workers that have passed away mm -hmm. from coronavirus. And it just blows my mind that they're doing this on a volunteer basis based on news article reports in order to honor those who've uh, passed away amongst our community as essential workers. And just like the renewed and strengthened focus on combating anti-Black racism in the AAPI community is really giving me hope. Thank you. So we're gonna, you all are kind of taking the conversation in the direction and so I'm gonna follow with it because I, four of you have mentioned anti-Black racism or three of you. And so I just want to, for you all to explain what that is and how it shows up, because I don't want to make the assumption that everyone who is watching this really understands what that means. And why is it important um, in the context of talking about Asian Americans that this is being elevated? Um, so I think Julie, Ryan, and um, Anisha, you all kind of elevated that. And if others did, please speak to it as well. Go ahead, Julie. Well, I can start. Um, so the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has focused on building this culture of health and advancing health equity. And what that really means is providing an opportunity for all Americans to have an opportunity for a fair and just life and eliminating obstacles to health and well-being. And those obstacles include racism, uh, whether it's anti-Black or anti-Asian racism. With those systemic racism factors that have been in play for many, many years, that's what's contributing to the health inequities that we see with baseline, but then also we see this play out in every single public health emergency. When I think back over the, my time in, at the Department of Public Health, I look at measles epidemics, I look at heat waves, and I look at who was most severely impacted. And what I see is that it was people of color who were dying or most li more likely to be infected. And so COVID is no different than any other public health crisis it exacerbates the underlying poor health of people of color. And why are they 
why are they having more problems with poor health? It's because of systemic racism and things in the past that have contributed to the conditions that they're living in so that their health is worse at baseline and then they do worse during a public health emergency. And what I feel now for the, in, in this pandemic and with the anti-black racism, um, the, the outrage that is occurring because of anti-black racist events recently, I'm feeling um, an openness I'm feeling like there's an opportunity for us to tear down some of these structures and these systems that have been in place for so long and actually do something about them. Because in past emergencies, those systems may have been touched a little bit, but we really didn't address the issue as you can see playing out through this pandemic and ongoing racist events. And so I think it's all related. Anti-racist, structural racism contributes to poor health overall. And the foundation is really focused on addressing and improving health overall unless we start tearing down some of the structural, structural racism and rebuilding. I think Ignatius mentioned that we really have to build new systems. We can't just fix the old system. We have to rebuild systems and structures so that we aren't in the same place when the next pandemic comes along. Can you show it, Ryan? Yeah, I would love, yeah, I'd love to add to it. I think the reason I'm calling out is anti-Black racism in terms of just being a South Asian and the lived experience of South Asian communities. I mean, there's a, there's a level of, um, there's no secret that there's an anti-Blackness in our, my community, at least in the South Asian community. It's built into the culture. There's colorism, there's casteism. There's a lot of these things that are sort of ingrained socially. What is important is, um, as a South Asian woman, an immigrant's child, you know, there's a there's a level of under, there's a myth that success is equated to whiteness. And I think that, um, so for me to call out, there's racism and then there's anti-black racism. As a non-black person of color, I have privilege um, as being a South Asian woman um, where in my family, just as immigrants, immigration and just the notion of immigration was built on the backs of African-American and the history of African-American um, African Americans in this country. And so I just, I think it's important to call it out. I think you and I have talked about this before about you got to name it to change it. And I think that um, it's not that racism isn't important. It is, but anti-Black racism and calling it out and being able to dismantle it is actually benefits everyone. And so I, I think the reason I, I distinguish between those two is because just as in, even in a non-Black person of color community, it's important to understand it. And then there's that lived experience. My husband is Black. My son is Blindian, right? And just, I don't want the future of my child to be in um, jeopardy the way that children are living right now in PTSD and just living in, in this racist society that we are in in 2020. Um, it's just, it's atrocious. So I think it's important to acknowledge it, to talk about it and to get take this opportunity to actually move us to a new normal of really truly dismantling with intentionality. So that's kind of the reason why I, I bring up both of those components. Thank you. And I would just build on uh, what uh, has been said. I think, you know, for us um, as immigrants, uh, healthcare is a huge domain for Asian American Pacific Islanders, South, Southeast, and East Asian immigrants. And there's a transporting of the culture of highly respected professions um, from our countries uh, among the first generation uh, for us. And in, in my personal experience, and that doctors, engineers, professors, and others um, coming to this country. And those, when I think about my, our own South Asian community, but also other um, a, Asian American Pacific Islander communities, those immigrant clinicians and um, professions ended up working in safety net hospitals, in public systems, in government. And it meant very, you know, is parallel to training, um, quote unquote, back home. And so who are the people that they were taking care of? They're taking care of in, in, in a um, black Brown and all kinds of um, uh, people with different backgrounds, and but particularly like in my own experience, really with um, uh, black people on the south side of Chicago, and and I think for some of those communities, the power structures um, have been easier uh, to maintain, and that there's this sense that um, one of the things we've got to do is you know think we think about racism as a chronic condition that needs upstream action and systemic action, but there are also particular communities, um, uh, black communities in particular that are disproportionately impacted. Uh, and now I think 
as Asian American Pacific Islanders of different generations, we have an opportunity, um, a privilege and a responsibility to I think make that power structure different, more horizontal and not colonial. And I think we've seen some of the examples of how folks have shown up. The Gandhi Mahal restaurant located, located just three doors down from the third precinct, which was burned down uh, in Minneapolis. Those restaurant owners as Bangladeshi immigrants um, just approach this very differently. Let my um, building burn justice needs to be served, the owner said. And they talked about continuing to amplify the importance of solidarity with black communities and undo anti-blackness within our own people. And that means explaining how white supremacy and racism are devastating to all people of color, including our communities. And so I think um, we've also seen this in DC with Raul Dubé who housed 70 protesters on Swan Street. Uh, and that conversation about what it, what it means to be human and how do we show up with our humanity in these moments, um, but also for the long term. Uh, and so that's, you know, part of what I think um, we all collectively have to come together around. Thank you. Ryan? I'll add to that. Um, I, I think when I think of anti-Blackness in the Asian community, I try to think very concretely. And um, there's these kind of more abstract notions, and I'm sure we'll get into things such as the model minority myth, but I also want to acknowledge that as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, we have the potential to also cause harm directly to other communities. I think of Latasha Harlins. I, since I grew up in Los Angeles, Latasha Harlins was a young black girl that was shot in the 90s in the head by an Asian grocery store owner over a bottle of orange juice. I think of Rodney King, who the police who beat him were acquitted uh, and that jury had Asian Americans on that jury. I think of George Floyd and I think of the complicity of the Asian American community directly with white supremacy and anti-black racism. And I think for us to get free, we really have to dismantle racism and, and really think about what that means, not just on like an abstract uh, level, but tangibly in our everyday lives. Thank you. Um, and so I'm gonna come back to ask, what does that mean tangibly, you know, at this point in time? Uh, but I wanna co come to Ignatius at this point and um, speak to the data parts of it. You mentioned data um, and um, I, I think this connects slightly with the model minority myth as well. Uh, and so, you know, some reflection on that, but the reality is like, what is the harm that ends up happening when folks are othered, like literally othered, right? Or lumped into one group and the, or this data is just absolutely missing, which we know is existing right now and has existed well before COVID as well. Um, and so just want you to speak a little bit more about kind of the data efforts that you've been engaged in um, and how are you elevating those challenges? What are your thoughts about closing those gaps and then those connections to being the model minority as well? Sure, so just a little bit of background. As of yesterday, when I checked uh, again, uh, 32 health departments are not reporting data on Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Seven health departments across the, the country are not reporting data about Asians in COVID-19. Um, and so we have a long way to go just to get to that very, very basic out of the other category and actually see ourselves in that data. Um, but what the point I've made is it's not just about COVID-19. We need that race, ethnicity, language, uh, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, et cetera, et cetera, data on every condition and every diagnosis. Um, we have in every hospital now, electronic health records that are supposed to be collecting mm -hmm. race, ethnicity, language, and all this other data. And the question is, those fields are still optional. The electronic health records are still not fully operational uh, at that level to actually document what those patient demographics are. And so we'll never really understand truly all the complicated risks, all the causations of why we're seeing those disparities, particularly I, I would say part of the anti-black racism is uh, not sort of doing this uh, uh, comparing oppression and comparing disparities. And I think it's really important as advocates for better data to say the data tells us that the disparities are most glaring for African-Americans, for black communities. And we need to lift that up and to lift up the need for more resources, not to diminish the need for resources for our communities, but to say, we need to follow the science. We need to follow the data. 
Um, and I think the, the pieces are in place to make this happen. And the question is really the will. Um, we have the standards, we have the capacity, and it's really, I think, taking this moment in time when we have the consciousness of why this is important to say, we need this data across communities, across all these intersectional identities to really understand how disease happens and then more importantly, how to prevent it and how to, to go upstream in the way that Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has to really think about those community solutions that, that uh, lessen those disparities and improve our health overall. And just again, it, thank you for that. That's helpful. And then going back to the data. So clearly the data shows the impacts and the severity of impact as it relates to black communities, as well as indigenous communities who also, it, it's highly impacted those communities and Latinx communities. Um, but the assumptions made as it relates to being the model minority, I think oftentimes moves us away from the conversation of what is happening with the Asian community and, and, and going deeper. And so like, so what do we do in order to, to go deeper and, and to move away those assumptions as it relates to being the model minority? Dr. Simone, do you have any thoughts? Well, go ahead, Ignatius, go ahead, go ahead. So there's two levels. <laughs> One is, and Dr. Simone can obviously speak to this, simply separating out the broad category of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders from Asians. Those are smaller populations with much greater health disparities than the Asian population as a whole. And then within the Asian American population, knowing the difference between Filipinos and Vietnamese and Koreans with all the diversity of, of our Asian American populations, Hawaii is the only state that is reporting data at that disaggregated level, separating out uh, Filipino from Chinese from Japanese. Um, so it can be done. And that's why I'm saying, again, it's not uh, a question yeah. of capability. It's a question of will at this point. Absolutely, I agree. And I'm a bit biased from being from at the New York City Department of Health. We did a, a health of Latinx and where we looked at more of country of origin and health outcomes. And we also did it for the Asian community in New York City. So it's possible. So for my team who's like putting links up, you know, can you put links up to show people um, on the YouTube? Dr. Simone, um, do you have any comment or reflection at this point? Uh, yeah, I wish this was a, a three-day conference. Um, uh, I'm learning a ton. Um, so uh, as Ignatius alluded to, yeah, there are higher rates. Um, my impetus to be involved, I needed a really strong reason to devote more time um, to another project that I really don't need in my life right now. So when the rates started to come out in California, we touch based with uh, our uh, advocates in, in other states. And in every state we looked at that had disaggregated data, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders was either the highest or the second highest um, rates. So um, that prompted us to put together a strategy and to work with uh, regional coalitions uh, to talk to their health departments, uh, but also to um, um, advocate for uh, all these, um, uh, things that we know will help with the pandemic, such as contact tracing, such as social uh, uh, support, um, safe quarantine. Um, and so when we started, um, we noticed the biggest problem we had that, you know, Ignatius alluded to was the lack of data. You know, although California State had reported, at that time we had no county data, right? And California is huge. And so it's hard to sort of gather where do you need to start with? Um, uh, and I apologize to Ryan and Jay. I know nothing about, about public health, but I'm going to speak something to it right now. So the public health cycle that I understand starts with data and then it leads to uh, the justification of allocation of resources. And then that goes to programming and then that's reevaluated uh, as data. Invisible communities such as Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, um, Native Americans, uh, Asian uh, populations, we are invisible. So there is no data. So there's no way for us to even partake in any of the downstream benefits of that cycle. So we, and we're in the midst of a, of a pandemic. We realized that our health info cycle starts with coalition building. 
coalition building leads to advocacy. Advocacy then brought about data because once we got that information and the community went out and started uh, prompting data to be reported, we found out data in Oregon, we found out data in, in uh, um, Arkansas, we found out data in Washington State, uh, in, in Hawaii, in Illinois, um, and all of them across the board, they all said the same thing, right? Um, so we, and that's, so what that brought about was media attention that started asking, well, what's the predisposition? What is it about Pacific Islanders that is making the rate so high? And then there was some tendency to ask me questions about biology, biologic predisposition, you know? And we have a, co you know, we are the, the diaspora in the rest of the Pacific in New Zealand that is genetically identical, that has the same, uh, uh, socioeconomic factors as the one in the U.S. is not suffering from this, you know. And so I was so happy that my vocabulary has increased um, with words such as anti-racism um, because this is anti-racism example, you know, that uh, there's a diaspora that is thriving that has access to these uh, opportunities and a diaspora that is suffering, that does not have access, um, based purely on their socioeconomic status, you know, and which is basically largely determined by um, our race and ethnicity. So, um, you know, the what what we've also realized is that um, the truth in data helps all of us. So some of our data has been mixed up with Asian populations. Um, but what we've realized is that our advocating for data to be truthful, it doesn't hurt us. What it did real make us realize is that there's the further disaggregation of Asian data will help uh, a lot of populations. You know, like most of the recategorized data was from Filipino communities. So it tells us that there's a problem with the Filipino community. You know that they they the, there's a that's pretty much unpublicized. You know, and uh, so uh, not to uh, beleaguer this, but that's, that's kind of uh, what we've been dealing with. Yeah, I appreciate that on many levels. Julie, I know you wanted to come chime in a little while ago. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, I think this is uh, such a, we could talk for days on this topic. Um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation feels very strongly about the need for disaggregation of data because in, from our perspective, having those data really give power. And I heard Ray was talking about this need for power building within community to advocate for change and having the data really allows groups to actually do that kind of advocacy. So at the end of May, we actually issued um, some health equity principles because we had the sense that state and local leaders were talking health equity but didn't really know how to operationalize it. And so our number one principle is really encouraging data disaggregation by age, by race, by gender, by ethnicity, by disability, by geography, and other socio-demographic characteristics, because that kind of information really does allow us to address, know where resources need to go, identify where the problems are, but also engage those communities to help build the solutions. Because the second principle that we have is really the communities that are most affected really need to be part of the solution making. And then we, unless we know who those communities are, we can't really do that kind of engagement. So that's our second principle. But it really relates to what you were talking about earlier, Aletha, in terms of feeding, the lack of data feeds into this concept of Asians as model minorities. Because as long as the data aren't disaggregated by ethnicity, Asians are lumped together. And our numbers and our health status, our health behaviors, the conditions within our communities look great. But the reality is that they are not consistent across the board as it relates to Asians, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians. We can't just be lumped together as one big group because it's very, very widely different in terms of what those conditions are, what the behaviors are, and what the health outcomes are. And so it is critical the data are really disaggregated. Absolutely. So Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, so um, no. something I want to say is uh, it's tough to follow all these uh, wonderful panelists, but uh, what I want to say is a lot of the disparities amongst the AAPI community in terms of chronic non-communicable disease, uh, Dr. Samoa uh, alluded to this, is in terms of diabetes, hypertension, uh, so on and so forth, were known. But I think the difference 
now is that with coronavirus, it's accelerating these inequities, these disparities, uh, because now you have this biologic pandemic that is literally killing folks at a faster rate. So like there's a renewed sense of urgency for this data so that we can meaningfully reallocate things such as PPE, housing for safe uh, quarantine. Um, so uh, you can reallocate ventilators potentially if, if ICUs and hospitals are being overwhelmed. And I, I remember when I was making a decision towards the end of my residency of what I was gonna do for fellowship and I decided to pursue a health services research fellowship. And one of my close friends said, data doesn't matter because people are gonna believe whatever they want to believe. But if you take a step back from it, not only are researchers and physicians and clinicians and, and lawyers such as us shouting for these numbers, but as I alluded to in the beginning, there's grassroots organizations who are literally on a volunteer basis looking at, all right, so there's a death of one Filipino nurse here. Let me confirm that with another newspaper just to be absolutely sure. People would not be pouring in all this energy and effort to this issue if it wasn't meaningful and if, if we didn't believe it, it potentially could save lives. Yeah, and it's a fascinating comment of what your, your friend said, because we actually, you know, there are people in the country who are saying that that data is not important. We're not going to believe that data. We're not going to believe that science and are creating decisions based on that. And that's, and it's harmful as well. So, but um, it also speaks to like justice and, and, and the root of, you know, movements and justice are always led by those who are experiencing it. Right. And um, and that's, I think, what you're kind of elevating, Ryan. Uh, and I think as physicians, you know, how are we connecting to those movements um, and how are we leading those movements are, are really important. Manisha, I know you wanted to say something as well, um, but I would love for you all as we kind of move and shift towards the end in that last 10 minutes of the show, um, you know, what are those solutions, um, you know, that we need to put forward? What are those opportunities as leaders, lawyers, physicians that we need to be screaming about that you all are, you know, kind of screaming about, we don't want to have to scream, but, um, but that we are calling upon um, other folks to, to be committed along with us. What are those things um, that need to happen? And Julie, you mentioned some of them already, but I'd like to expand on that, but uh, Dr. Sharma. Yeah, so I, I I love what Ryan and Julie everyone is saying because I think as a as a ground doc um, and a and an activist, one of the things is there's the academic components of data, right? Data tells the story, but a lot of times when when I engage with community based organizations, um, they're so thankful that us as physicians or nurses or social workers or um, who actually come and talk to them about the data, but then help them find ways to use the data to elevate their voice. So I guess what I, to point um, to your point about movement, I think we have an opportunity, um, we've always had it, but I think now more so where we can actually get out of the exam room or get out of the telemedicine video and be able to sort of get on the street. Um, this is an opportunity for us to take the knowledge that we have and share it in a way that's meaningful. So to like Ryan's point, help folks understand and connect the dots on how to use the data so they can elevate um, in a justice way. Health is everyone's um, Health is everyone's work. Um, racism and, and dismantling racism is everyone's work. It should be all of our personal work. And I think as a physician, one of the things that I try to encourage younger physicians coming up is to get them to understand that uh, medicine is also following virtue and just being able to think about medicine as the fact that it's, it's, it's about being able to pay attention to your society. It is about politics. It is about um, policy. It's about getting involved in those spaces and not in an academic way, but in a intentional sustained way and then being able to bring people along. Um, and so I just say that the data is part of the story, but now it's about how to apply the data in actionable items. And um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Can I add to that? Please. Uh, so I, I agree fully with you, Manisha. Um, there's a tendency of physicians to advise the community, but in this time and space, we now need to become the community. Um, uh, so I was diagnosed with COVID right before the data was pushed out. And so there was a lot of comments about um, income 
Um, but, you know, it dawned upon me that, you know, I, I am at a level of privilege, but I am in an ethnic demographic that has high numbers of essential workers. Let's not, let's not forget that. And that doesn't erase it because I'm a physician. Um, and so let, let things that have to deal with socioeconomics deal with, you know, let us find solutions to that. But things that are based in racism, we need to find solutions to that. And so that's kind of pushed me into this realm of, of, of leading community um, because like you said, the data tells a story, but what happened when, when we got the data was public health officials looked at us and said, well, what would we do? What's the plan? Um, because you know they weren't able to engage the community before the, the pandemic. What, nothing's changed about that. They still have obstacles in regards to um, uh, delivering uh, interventions to us. So one of the things that we had to do with the strategy was once we get the data, what do we do? What's the, what's the plan? And luckily for us, um, the strategy is held up in all the regions, you know? And so these community groups have increased testing to, you know, community-led testing has exponentially increased um, testing. Uh, there's community uh, health worker contact tracers that are being hired all over the place. But, oh, I got to tell you, you know, there's, there's so many aspects of it. I'm leading uh, a faith-based group to do weekly updates by language and, and, and leveraging the existing podcasters um, to, to do it. So, you know, because, because we have 300 people volunteering their efforts you know, um, because there's not a lot of funding streams and we have to be very innovative uh, in supporting this work, you know. And so, um, yeah, there's there's and, and then on the policy side, too, you know, we, we we've had to push. I hate policy. I have no business talking about policy. So I lean on on on, um, you know, Asian, black, Latinx uh, policy experts uh, to take us into those spaces. Um, uh, because like you said, the story is, is, is our story, um, but we need to do a better job of navigating that story, you know, and, um, you know, it's time for physicians to get our hands dirty. Yeah. So, um, speaking of that in a way, um, so let's kind of round Robin in, in a sense. Um, so Ignatius, you know, what, what are those solutions? And I'm going to move to Jay. And then I'm going to just flow up my screen <laughs> of how you all are located. But Ignatius and then Jay have kind of, so what is it, what, what are your recommendations at this point in time? And I'm asking for them to be succinct uh, so that we can get through everybody. So I just want to lift up um, all the frontline workers, and particularly in the physician community, those that are working in community health centers, at public hospitals, those in solo and small practices, that often don't get a whole lot of attention. These are the folks that are providing a lot of care to Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, don't have access to the technology, don't have access to the other kinds of supports that larger systems and, and medical groups have. And so I think really supporting those physicians to provide information to their communities, to support the contact tracing that's gonna be needed, and to really keep lifting up the disparities that they're seeing every single day so that they do get the resources that they need to serve their, their patients. And just gonna dig a little deeper now, what does support look like? So if you all can answer that as we go through, because I, support to me is like one of those words like community. It's like one of those words like access. It's very broad and can mean many things. And I just, I think specificity to what we mean and how to do that is really important. Um, Jay? Sure, thanks, and this has been really rich conversation. I just build on uh, what's been said. One, I think we've got to accept responsibility in a meaningful way, and accepting responsibility for enabling shared purpose in this face of uh, in the face of uncertainty. And so that means understanding where, as an organization, we are, where as an individual we are, where as a community we are, and then saying, well, what do we need to do to get better? Uh, and so an assessment of sorts, and that needs to happen internally. So you got to have to um, work in your own house to then uh, improve the community also around you. And that's, uh, I think, um, important. And, and I think the Robert Johnson Foundation has been really great in helping um, move that notion forward as well. The other is um, educating and communicating with, with individuals in your community in the ways that resonate with them. Not all 
communities will take in or engage in information and interactions in the same way. So understanding that. Um, building and strengthening the community partners and organizations that through COVID and through the economic downturn, they've been impacted. And so how do we help support them all? Identifying policy systems and environmental changes that uh, can address racism and inequities. Um, and then on the data piece, um, I'll, I'll agree with what's been said. The, only, the other thing I'll point out at the, in this moment where we see technology accelerating, uses of data through machine learning, predictive analytics and AI accelerating, Asian American Pacific Islanders are still invisible. And so that data is becoming intelligence that's turning into action and we're making it, we're driving action on invisible people. Um, so organizations and individuals need to ask themselves and, and check that before making decisions based on that data. Uh, and, so, and then sharing what we learned. Those things that are working, we need to amp harvest and amplify uh, and advance uh, contextually in the ways that work for communities. So thank you, Ryan. Okay, we're just we have a few minutes, so I want okay. to get through all I'll, of you. I'll be concise. I, I think just thinking more structurally in terms of as an Asian American Pacific Islander community supporting anti-racist policies, the Green New Deal, food sovereignty, housing, universal health care. We can't do that unless we shed our own, in my opinion, anti-Blackness, because how do we build coalitions with other groups and build up the momentum to get these things passed? So I think a lot of that has to do with knowing the history of systemic and structural anti-Black racism, even within our professions, reading medical apartheid, studying the work of David R. Williams, uh, and really unlearning this notion of like this myth of meritocracy. I think it really starts there. And then that's how you build meaningful coalitions. And that's how you translate that into power shifts and policies. Thank you. Uh, Manisha? Yeah, I, I wanna amplify what everyone has said, but one thing I would also say, make this your personal work um, every day. And also if you have spaces of privilege and opportunity, bring someone along. I think that's the other piece of this is to amplify voices that are um, not being able to be heard or have been screaming, it's, you know, but never being heard. So it's just, I've made it um, a constant for me to actually make this my personal work, um, stopping ignorance where I hear it, see it, um, and also being able to not alienate, but help people see their own implicit biases and then being able to move them forward. I agree with what Ryan is saying, but it's also about providing opportunity. If you have one, then share the opportunity and move it forward. Thank you. Julie? Yes, I, when I think about the audience, if this is, if we're speaking to physicians, I think of physicians having numerous roles in their lives as clinicians who take care of patients. So my suggestion is really as, as a clinician taking care of patients to think about the individuals and their conditions rather than just what their race is not looking at them as I think Ray mentioned the biologic aspects associated with race and whether or not we attribute disease or poor health outcome to biologic factors, thinking about actually the conditions that are contributing to these people's health outcomes and health behaviors. So shifting that kind of frame and also focusing on educating the patients so they understand themselves in this current context, what are resources that are valuable and appropriate and safe to use? Because I think there's so much misinformation out there. And so relying on CDC guidance or documentation is really, and, and recommendations is really important because though they may be undermined for political reasons, they are really the best public health recommendations that we have. The other role that physicians actually play is as researchers. So using equitable approaches to research so that when we're doing research, we're doing it in equitable ways. And then the other area is we are, as physicians, we are leaders and we have voice and we have power. So to use that to advocate for equitable policies, deconstructing, um, systems and structures and policies that have contributed to structural racism over the decades. These are the things that we can do as physicians. So as clinicians, as researchers, as leaders and advocates, there's many roles that we can play. Awesome. Well, we're at the very end. Um, and I just want to thank all of you. And I, I've learned a lot through this show. Um, and it's, it's going to be one of my favorite ones. And one day I'll tell you why. But I, there, there's something that Dr. Samoa said um, that I, from, as a public health person, and, and you're mentioning of the public health cycle, and, and your framing of how you said it was so poignant. And I talk a lot about, and I have this vision of public health and healthcare coming better together. Um, it's, it's critical, I think, for our country, instead of having these 
separate si these siloed systems. And Dr. Samoa, you pointed out why. One of, you know, and I, and I think there are opportunities like that of learning on, on in, through both systems. But if we don't come together um, in better and more intentional ways and find out how to pull our leaders on the healthcare side and on the public health side together in consistent ways, um, we're going to lose those opportunities. So um, I'm putting that out there, you know, because that is definitely some of the work and the intention of the center. And anybody who likes to join along and helping to support that, we're all for it. So thanks a lot for everyone today, for your voice, uh, for your leadership, your advocacy, um, and, and just demonstrating, you know, what it means to really step into this justice space and, and to center and prioritize equity. So thanks a lot. And thanks to all who, are, who have tuned in. This will be available, you know, to show. And, and honestly, a lot of the ways these uh, shows have been showed have been post the, the actual taping. So we highly recommend for it to be shared, but it will be available by the end of today. So thanks a lot to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bibbing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.